Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi So, uh, Jazakallah khair, uh, Dr. Shangiti, and for Triple IT for hosting me here, alhamdulillah. Uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's an honor to be here at the institute that we've read a lot about, um, whose books we've read avidly, and alhamdulillah to be actually uh, uh, sharing an office space with uh, Professor Anjam actually is uh, quite a bounty, alhamdulillah, so may we all give thanks. Um, so I'm going to, inshallah ta'ala, start uh, with, with, uh, with du'a that Allah ma alimna bi wa yanfa'una wa yanfa'una bi wa tu'alimuna wa sidna bi fadhika al-ilma wa ta'aliman inna ka'ala kuli shayin qadir that Allah enlighten us and ennoble us uh, with the knowledge and give us grant us beneficial knowledge, inshallah, in this lecture. Uh, so as you heard, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, constructing the field of Islamic bioethics and particularly for our audience, since many of you come from different aspects of Islamic studies, why I think this growing field is pretty important uh, for the study of Islam generally. So, uh, there we go. so here's the agenda for the talk. Um, I want to talk about Islamic bioethics generally as, as the literature, highlight the principal producers and consumers of this developing field, and then talk uh, a little bit about the conceptual gaps that plague the field of Islamic bioethics. That will make a good segue to the second part of the talk, which discusses key questions that inform the construction of this field and how they relate uh, and are important for the study of Islam. Particularly, I want to focus on three areas. Uh, one about source material and methods of study of Islam. Uh, the second area is going to be about Muslim uh, embodiment uh, and identity formation. And the third uh, aspect is going to be about epistemology and disciplinary boundaries of ethics. And lastly, should we have time, inshallah, I'm on the timer myself, to, uh, I'm going to highlight a little bit more about my research project on the applicability of maqasid frameworks for biomedicine, uh, particularly around how they might provide a vision for the essential dimensions of health and well-being, uh, as well as a theological framework for bioethics, such as say, and, and, and healthcare structuring. So inshallah ta'ala, that is my hope. Um, I will, because I'm on a time limit, I'm going to have a little bit of interaction, uh, but I'm probably not going to take your questions in between, so that we can have a robust uh, question and answer session at the end, if you don't mind. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, I, uh, as you heard from Dr. Shankiti, I lead this program, uh, the Initiative on Islamic Medicine at the University of Chicago, which conducts research at this intersection uh, between the Islamic tradition, biomedicine, and Muslim practices. So we study how Islam and Islamic religiosity inform the way in which Muslims uh, take care of their health, the things they do uh, to seek health care, and then the challenges that they face in the healthcare care system. But we conduct research of Muslim physicians in the way that they perceive Islam to inform their identity as physicians, in the way that Islam might inform challenges they face in the healthcare system as professionals, as well as how Islam serves as a source of ethical guidance for them in their practice. And then we study uh, ulema broadly defined, uh, who opine on biomedicine through their legal writings. Uh, they incorporate scientific knowledge, how do they do so, and then when they give fatawa and other rulings, what are the constructs by which they attend to the biomedical imagination. So we conduct empirical, textual, and theological research. And all of this, you know, so the first step of an academic, they will tell you that we need to do research. The goal of this research actually is to create conversation between various different disciplinary, bound, uh, disciplinary experts to create a holistic understanding of both how we might improve the healthcare system uh, to accommodate Muslim patients, and then how we might form uh, this field of Islamic bioethics. So that's my work broadly defined and the initiative that I lead at the University of Chicago. So now let's start with just talking about the field of Islamic bioethics. Uh, the first, this is a question for you all, right? So, so who needs and who searches for Islamic bioethical guidance? You are all here. And the talk said Islamic bioethics. So this would help, this should tell me that you can form and answer this question. So who searches for it? Who says something here? So, sorry, I, I just came, I don't know so, what's going on. So what's the question? Who, who needs or who searches for Islamic bioethical guidance? I think the patients and the doctors. The patients and doctors, and how come? I mean, they are the first, uh, they are involved, right? This is about bioethics, so patient and uh, doctor would be the first. Well, for what purpose? Oh, for the management. Okay, so they're seeking bioethical guidance for the management of their patient, of, of, physicians are for the management of patients. Right. And patients are for what purpose? Oh, for their benefit, I guess, you know, <laughs> from a uh, religious point of view. I've, Obviously, uh, we're talking about Muslims. Okay. So, 
they would want to do it the way Sunnah and the Sharia. Okay, sense. very good. Other thoughts? Other other people? Yes. Um, I think this, I, I don't know too much about this, but I'm guessing. We are in a continuous negotiation uh -huh. as Muslims with our environment because uh, um, continuously we have to worry about is it the right thing to do? Are we um, stepping out of the boundaries? And to me it seems like that is the kind of question you're looking at. So what group? So we talked about patients and physicians. You're identifying what group? I think that we're looking at uh, all the Muslims. Uh, and so they can negotiate what specifically? Whatever challenges face them in terms of their uh, their health or the, the uh, treatments they're faced with, okay. the choices they make. Okay. So there's a question of organ donation. Mm -hmm. There's a question of uh, um, uh, transplant, right. accepting organs, and so all those kind of things. All right. So let me add another. Any other thoughts? Last thought here. Please go ahead. I think researchers in pharmaceuticals as well as in the medical field in general. For what purposes? Again, because you know, are certain things that um, ethical, like um, the genetic type of stuff with um, replication and things like that. Right. As well Many as fund centers and chaplains now in hospitals mm -hmm. uh -huh. increasingly are looking for right, right. So I think you, we've covered most of <coughs> these. So I, I'll call them the consumers of Islamic bioethics writing. We identified patients, right, who might uh, Muslim patients who might want accordance between the medical care they receive and Islamic regulations as they perceive them. Muslim healthcare providers who desire for an Islamic ethos, right, and ethics for their practice. Religious leaders, as you identified, uh, Dr. Mir, right, who seek religiously and medically constant guidance uh, to help counsel patients, providers, and others. You know, healthcare institutions in general, right, particularly in this context, right, that are servicing Muslim patients. Uh, they want to identify resources to assist in providing culturally sensitive and high quality healthcare. And then there's a variety of unnamed but, you know, polymorphous actors, policy advocates and community leaders, I call them, you know, who seek information and data that can help make the case for cultural accommodations and Muslim-sensitive healthcare structuring and policies. Now, I'll just give you an anecdote. Um, so, last week, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a forum at the White House um, on precision medicine, uh, and, you know, there were, they were trying to create a database of, uh, a population representative database of people who have given their tissues or have given some saliva and genetic codes so they can create tailored therapies for the population of the United States. Now they're trying to get a diverse population, so they have, you know, uh, Hispanic communities, you know, African American communities, and various other actors. And a Muslim organization was invited to that forum because they wanted to have Muslims represented potentially, right? In that as well. So in the sense that there's this huge policy ramification of how healthcare is structured <laughs> that might be informed by Muslims being at the table. Um, so in any case, this is just one way in which uh, this is important. So the other side, we talked about the consumers, the other side are the producers of Islamic bioethics, right? And, and I'm going to take them in here also for you to share with me who you think are the ones who are writing about Islamic bioethics. Who are the producers of this material? People like you. <laughs> People like me. I'm, uh, uh, okay, a physician, right? So a physician, go ahead, others. Faqih. 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 Okay, so, uh, Islamic jurist, all right. Others? I'm going to go back to say what we just said. Actually, Islamic uh, Muslims <coughs> from North America started as one of the fundamental things, this area. They did it at whatever way, but it's come to a whole new level with uh, uh, scholars like Yang, uh, Dr. Pedro. So what he said is very correct. So a Muslim organization or a professional body? Anything else? One more thought? Researcher. Researchers? Researchers? Oh, what type of research? What do you mean? Islamic studies research is very good. So I think we've covered them all. So typically, when you ask someone on the street, you, know, you would get uh, in, uh, in this thought, okay, well, if I ask a question, as you said, or one person said here, organ donation or transplant, what's the Islamic ethical opinions on this? You would have a physician who often raises the question to a jurist, right? And a jurist uh, thinks about the Quran, Sunnah, Maqas, the Sharia, Qawai, the Faqiyah, and all these other things from the textual sources and the formal sources of Islamic law. 
and then thinks about whether such an act is along the spectrum, you know, the Hanafi F7, but I'm here giving to the other uh, schools here. So in any case, he comes out with a fatwa, right? Or you have many scholars and many physicians coming together and, uh, you know, a, a decision, a qarat are issued, or various decisions are issued around this issue. And many people think that this is actually Islamic bioethics proper. Right? This is a central aspect. The fatwa are the central aspect where Islamic bioethics is produced, and it's produced by these individuals, jurists. Now, uh, as someone also sitting in the Islamic studies uh, section of the, of the academy, I'll tell you that this is actually a little bit problematic. And we'll leave that for the Q&A uh, session. But fatawa inherently have limitations, and that means that they cannot necessarily use them to form the normative. This is an idea. But in any case, that's where most people point. So you'll see, okay, we'll go online and find fatawa on organ donation. I didn't do this because she there was no conversation with us, but this is a... The, the, the website I pulled up. But there are other producers of Islamic bioethics writing, right? So there are physicians who write for physician and patient audiences. These are all papers, several years old, from Medline, which is a public, uh, a bibliographical database that medicine uh, physicians look, look towards. You have, as someone mentioned, Islamic studies individuals of a variety of sorts, right? So these two books here are by John Brockup from uh, conferences, uh, who's a historian, Islamic historian of Maliki texts, actually. There is Vardar Esperheim, who's in Haifa. She's an Islamic law person from UCLA initially. You have our professor, Abdulaziz Sachedina, that we all know, who's here at uh, George Mason. And then you have Daryush Adegeshi, who's actually, his training is in comparative law uh, and human rights, I believe, uh, in Switzerland. So you have a different sorts of academicians who have PhD qualifications in some Islamic studies and, or looking at Muslim studies, and they're writing as well on this topic. You have physician organizations, as mentioned by Dr. Mir again, you know, Imana, right, and others. This is the IOMS uh, on the bottom here, the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences in Kuwait, uh, which come together. Sometimes they bring together physicians and physician uh, sort of ethicists to come and opine on Islamic medical issues, bioethical issues, sorry. Or they actually bring jurists into conversation as well. Uh, this is what some place no one really mentioned, but these are you know these are ministries of health in quote unquote Islamic countries, right? So Saudi Arabia, Iran, and Pakistan, they also issue decrees and they issue laws. And one could say that when I want to look at you know Islamic bioethics in vivo, that's where I have to go. A uh, mentee of mine is doing a doctorate at Oxford. And she's interested in research guidelines in the Muslim world, right? And Islamic ethical research guidelines. And her primary source material is the production of these bodies, who have in their in their statutes that they are ruled and governed, at least a source of law for their policies is Islam. So how do they determine health research, and what do they think about? Right? One can argue that that is also a genre and a source, and these are producers of Islamic bioethics material. So, with all these individuals and all these different disciplines brought together to write about Islamic bioethics, it's no surprise that there's a lot of confusion, right? On what is ethics, what is Islamic, what is bioethics, what is medical ethics, what's clinical ethics. And so, I want to kind of hold that suspense, because actually that is the case of the field. So, I will argue, and, uh, if I can have the time to argue, but I'll tell you that there's not only conceptual confusion around what is good and right, what is wrong, what's permissible, what's haram, Right, that you can glean from these writings. But most of these writings miss the mark. And for me, the mark is that it is immediately actionable by a patient or physician. Right? That your writing is immediately actionable by a patient or physician at the bedside. For me, as a physician, that's my bias. I want things that can be applicable, that can be applied by me at the bedside. Right? So that's my bias. I think a lot of bioethical conversation occurs in that patient physician relationship. But that's my marker. And so that my argument is that this stuff doesn't, doesn't meet the mark for us. It doesn't meet the threshold for that. And I'll give you examples. Uh, and I'll give you examples from my own guild so that I don't, you know, uh, hurt anybody else's feelings. But so this is a friend of mine, Hassan Shanawani. He and, uh, uh, and Mohammed Hassan Khalid did a, a review of Medline literature. Again, this is, a, this is the database that we use as physicians. And these journals are the ones that we look to for medical and ethical guidance. So he reviewed uh, articles for over 55 years, 1950 to 2005 with just these two search terms, Islam or Muslim and bioethics. He found 146 papers, so that's less than three a year, right, over this 55 year period. And the authors were from, uh, the majority were from the Middle East and then the next group was from the United States. What's important for all of us here, 
as we see that triple IT, is this is the content. Only 11 papers, less than 10%, mention more than one universal Islamic position. Only five mention anything about concepts or sources of Islamic law. Right? And these are physicians opining on Islamic bioethics. I mean, the titles of the paper, or the abstracts, talk about Islamic or Muslim bioethics. So what did they base? That's a very good question. I can give you those papers. <laughs> but, but the implication is what? That the writings lack scholarly depth, and they present a character of the Islamic ethical legal tradition as monolithic and simplistic. <laughs> right. So that if you go as a researcher, you're going to look at this material, you'll find that potentially this is not going to service you, and nor does it service the patient at hand. So uh, that's in uh, 2005. Uh, this is a, a survey that uh, I did uh, in, 2013, in 2013. So we did a national survey of American Muslim physicians that was funded by the John Templeton Foundation and in collaboration with Imana. So we uh, mailed out a, a questionnaire to a random sample of almost 750 physicians from the Imana membership over uh, in 2013, three different waves using the standard, uh, you know, uh, up-to-date methodologies for survey, <coughs> mail surveys. So this, these are the results, right? So 85% of these physicians reported being somewhat or very familiar with Islamic bioethics. And 59%, so less than, uh, you know, two-thirds reported Islamic bioethics somewhat or greatly influences their practice. So compared to the data before, you would say this is pretty, pretty good, right? But this is what they do. Uh, you know, nearly or less than, or 55%, you know, more than a half, never really read any Islamic bioethics books. You know, nearly two-thirds never really consult any Islamic jurists when they face a bioethical challenge. Nearly 80% never or rarely look to Islamic Medical Fiqh Academy verdicts. So there's a dissonance here between an assumption of what we know and then how we know it. Right? So I, I use the term, they don't know what they don't know. Right? As a guild, we don't know what we don't know. And I hope to remedy that by some of the stuff that I'm doing here at Triple IT, but this is a state. Now, as that's the physicians, and then you can imagine what the patients receive as often in the masajid and in the healthcare encounter, you seek Muslims, physicians to give you guidance. And it's not necessarily clear that you're looking for medical guidance, you're looking for ethical guidance. So we can only imagine, right, what the patient population is understanding, or the imams who get their guidance from physicians some way. So I think this is a challenge for our community. So here's the current state of the field, right? As I mentioned to you, the producers, there are many different disciplines engaging uh, in this field with different goals and expertise. There's largely a silo problem with little crosstalk. The conceptual issues, which is going to be the next part of my talk. Um, you know, so what defines the Islamic? You know, what is the scope of bioethics? These are the two terms to create the field, but these conceptual issues plague the field. The methodological issues, as I pointed out a little bit, uh, right? What are the source materials for study of Islamic bioethics? And then what are the methods used to research and develop such materials? Right, that's an open question. And there are practical issues. That there are scattered writings of limited insight that are available to the population at hand. And there's really a crisis of authority regarding Islamic bioethical expertise. Who is the Islamic bioethicist that you, that you can get guidance from or should expect to get guidance from? Is it the Muslim chaplain? We have a chaplaincy sort of uh, mode in the last 10 years in the United States. Is it the chaplain? Is it the imam in the masjid? Is it the mufti sitting in the academy, right? In the seminary, sorry. Is it the physician at the bedside? Is it the academic who's writing books, right, uh, may have or not have any interaction with the community at large? Or is it the sociologist who studies how actually Muslims make ethical decisions, right? Who is it? Or is it all of them? So this plagues this developing field. And I think this makes it that there is such a tremendous opportunity to advance Islamic studies in this field that we should all be involved in the conversation. As immediate relevance to us, we're all patients at one level, right? and also has for the broader study of Islam in general. So let me point some of those out. So why is Islamic bioethics, at least in my view, important to the study of Islam? So I mentioned this at, uh, you know, at one level, that Islamic bioethics is concerned with the normative. Right? And by the normative, I mean what is Islam? And what signifies the Islamic? Right? Some could say that Islam is, you know, uh, from a sociological, social science perspective, a tradition of practices observed by a community. Right? That could be a community that's time-bounded, or it could be a community that consists today and continues on. But that's a tradition of practices, and that is what Islam is, and then your methodology for studying Islam would be based on that. 
Some could say it's a meaning-making system, right? That's a negotiated system all the time. That's the embodiment that makes something Islam, right? Uh, that it doesn't reside within text necessarily. So this makes it creates a cultural system. So as a cultural anthropologist, right, or as actually an empirical scientist, you might develop tools and measures to understand this meaning-making that's occurring in the so in society. You might look at what is Islam from a more theological perspective. I know that term has somewhat uh, inconsistent relevance within the Islamic tradition, but in one sense you can say, well, you know, what is moral what is Islamic moral theology? Is it grounded in fiqh? Is it law? Is that what makes something Islamic? Or makes it Islam? That's the marker. Right? Is it is Islamic represented by, at least in ethics, by the adabi or akhlaqi sciences? By the sciences of virtue or the knowledge of, of virtue? Is that what defines something as Islam or Islamic? That's the marker of the tradition. Right, what is the role of Kalam in Sufism? And, and I use those in terms for an ontology and epistemology here. Right? Uh, that where does that come into play when you think about it, Islam? So these, these, are, these are questions about developing a moral theology, and it comes out in Islamic law and ethics, and obviously then it's reflected into the Islamic bioethical field, or whatever the field we try to create. At the same time, you can think about what is Islamic? What signifies the Islamic, right? Is the Islamic source bounded? You hear this today, uh, you know, again, the last 20 years is something that we've all become in some way traditionalists or Laharites, but we all say Quran and Sunnah, you bandy it about, right? So is it source bounded? Is the Islamic source bounded? That you say, okay, I can see an ayat referred to here in this writing that makes it Islamic. Or I see a hadith quoted here that makes it Islamic. Or that person is wearing something that we know the Rasulullah did, so that's the sunnah, that makes him Islamic. Right? Signifying what is Islamic is very important for the study of Islam. And here again, it comes to fore in Islamic bioethics. Uh, some would argue that what is Islamic is scholar bounded. So it's a negotiated tradition of understandings that are promulgated by a scholarly class. And no, that has implications for naturalizing authority in a certain class of ulama. But in any case, it's a discursive tradition. That's what's bounded. So the fact that it's Islamic, right, is not that it is necessarily textually, uh, textually bound or in text, but rather it's part of this understanding, right? This 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 oral quote, quote unquote oral tradition, or this group of individuals who have come to some understanding, that they they offer us what is the Islamic, okay. In our lives, we have this, forget about bioethics, we have this, this issue with what we think about when we make decisions in any case, right? When you decide what to purchase for mortgage, what's Islamic, what's not. Right? So in any case, th this is something that, that, that is part of this field. Another area, or another sort of idea, staying within the same, um, same parameters, right? So there's, there's Islamic bioethics has to do with the end goals of bioethical practice, right? So, so how do we move from what we can do, or after we answer that question, to what should we do, right? From, and another way to say that would be from moving from the zone of Islamic permissibility from the mubah, which is a legal minimum, right? Or some would say actually makru is because there's no afterlife sin, to ihsan, right? The perfective optimum. How do we move there? How can an Islamic bioethics inform that, right? And that's, that's also germane to all the sciences of, of Islamic law and theology. How do we get people there? How do we decide what's there? So, and, and another qu important question is how do we connect uh, the, the production of good to the being good? Right? This also has the same idea. So how do I, now I'm not just worried about the, 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 the act, but I'm worried about the agent of the act. Right? So it's not just the act is permissible, rather I want someone to be good in themselves. Right? So in the Quran, Allah talks about right, uh, uh, the son of, uh, of uh, Nuh, right? No, I'm not a right? That he is, right? He is an action that is, right? When you talk about Nuh alayhi salam, the son of a prophet, he's asking about him, and he's, Allah SWT uses this idea that, at least, right, a, 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 a term, that he is bad deeds. Not that he does. So the production, we're all involved in production, the production of our deeds are good. So this is, this is also germane to Islamic bioethics. So why, you know, I think it's relevant is because of what I just said. That all of these questions are germane to Islamic studies. Right? What we define as Islam informs the methods of study of Islam. There are different ways of studying Islam in the academy. Right? Some talk about the academic study of Islam, the sociological study of Islam. Right? The, and there are some talk about the seminary study of Islam. 
The Islamic informs what we think about as the recovery, renewal, or revivalist projects that we're all involved in in some way or form on this land. That's why you're here at Triple IT, I would assume. Right? Um, and, and questions about who is the expert and authority also plague our daily lives as well as Islamic studies. It really informs the ways we connect to and produce the Islamic tradition. I would argue that the Islamic tradition is being produced. It is continually produced. It is not one that resides somewhere in the past. So constructing the field of Islamic ethics demands conceptual rigor and clarity as it engages with other moral frameworks in our pluralistic society and there provide, provides the venue for critical engagement with the intellectual tradition and its authority structures. So that is why, in one way at least, Islamic bioethics is important to the study of Islam. So I said I want to talk about two other ways, so let's move to the second way. <clears throat> this is about identity formation. So Islamic bioethics addresses identity formation in politics. Right. And what do I mean by that? Well, it addresses the question of what makes a Muslim physician distinctive. Right? Is a Muslim physician an Islamic physician, quote unquote, because they practice some version of Islamic medicine? Right? That they're practicing remnants of Tibbun Nawawi or something else. That what they're doing, the, the, the service that they're providing, right, resides or is based upon uh, frameworks and thinkings that are embedded and bound within the Quran and Sunnah in some sort of way, or at least that time period. Is that what makes a person a Muslim physician, qua Islamic physician? Or is it that the Muslim physician who's, right, is one who follows Islamic ethics and law? Right? Islamic bioethics needs to understand that because you would have to say that, no, it's the Islamic, the, the material that makes it Islamic, or it is actually the, the act, the agent that makes it Islamic, right? So, or is the Islamic physician one who's living out a practice of medicine, believing it to be a calling from God? And this is something that I borrow from, from our uh, Christian colleagues, right? This idea of calling, which, which to my, in my research, has not really exist as well in the Islamic tradition. All right, there is much more of a, a, a divorce between uh, shul, right? Uh, and <laughs> what you do in your daily life and what my religious spiritual practices might be. But in any case, is someone in this context who says that I am a physician because I was called by God to be a physician, does that constitute him as a Muslim Islamic physician? Right. Or actually, is there no such thing? There's no such thing as an Islamic or Muslim physician. Medicine is the same everywhere in the world, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or in Pakistan or is in the United States, right? The tools, the techniques that we use is all the same. It's all globalized. It's biomedicine. Why are we worried about the Muslim Islamic physician? Can there be one? So that's the point where it addresses identity politics, not just formation, right? What does it mean to be a Muslim in the United States? Or how do we mark uh, a Muslim professional identity in a pluralistic context, right? So this moves from, from, from just formation to politics, right? What binds us together? We are Muslim physicians trained in different sort of circumstances, ages, epics, institutes, countries. So if we're calling for an Islamic bioethical norm, how does that bind us together or does it not bind us together? Right? So that's just internal in the Muslim community. What about the larger question? Is Islamic bioethics for Muslims or for all? So I did a conference in 2011 at the University of Chicago, which is called Where Religion, Bioethics, and Policy Meet. Uh, and uh, I had invited as a speaker uh, a professor of law uh, from a Christian Catholic College, and he asked this question. He just asked this question, and people were dumbfounded because they hadn't thought about it. Right? Is the Islamic bathrooms you're producing for me, or is it just for you? Right? Do you believe it's for me, or do you believe it's for you, or is it for everybody, or is it not? And that again informs the formation of a Muslim physician identity and their ethical character or the bioethics that they want to produce and be involved with. So again here, all these questions are germane to what I'm going to say, Muslim studies, not Islamic studies, but Muslim studies, right? What is the Islamic Muslim position? That refers to self-identification with the faith, and then it therefore informs descriptive and cultural studies of Muslims. The notions of identity formation and politics, these represent a critical area for engaging with modernity. We live in a globalized society, right? And how we engage with that and what we think are the rubrics for engaging with that are related to the Islamic bioethics. So, so here is the opportunity, I think, for Islamic studies in, or Muslim studies in general 
that the discipline of Islamic bioethics, and here are their quotes, so Islamic bioethics, you know, uh, studies would require understanding how the ethical becomes lived and understood, and thereby represents a connection between Islamic studies proper, right, and Muslim studies. So, just playing upon the textual versus sociological perspective. Okay, so now a third area, before I end shortly. Um, so, th this has to do with how, you know, we Muslims living in a, in a, in a, uh, what's the word? Living in a sanctified um, and, and in some ways a, a fortress of identity and texts, right? gaze upon the other, the world out there, right? So this picture is from the Islamic uh, uh, Art Museum in Doha, right? Doha, you know, has all those buildings didn't exist when I was there in 2005. They all came up after that, it looks like. So, so in any case, Doha is at this epicenter of engaging with modernity. So here are some questions that I think, again, why Islamic is important, right? And the, and, the, and the panel on the left here, right, um, typifies that, right? So, so it's, it's a dialogue between the science and Islam. Do we read science into the text, or do we read it outside? Uh, read it out from the text in a certain way, right? So, is our ethical legal imagination residing within the text, or is it one that we, we approach the text with? So, to give you an example, when we think about the idea or a construct in Islamic law of istihada, right? This is a making halal istihada, make something halal that was haram before. The imagination with what legal theorists looked at were that they knew that there were hadith talking about wine being prohibited, there were chronic injunctions, but we knew that vinegar was said by Rasulullah to be a great condiment, right? So what happens to wine when it becomes vinegar? Because something that's haram becomes halal. And they approached that, it was in the text, right, with an imagination, with a scientific imagination, a technical imagination, by what's happening. And if I can tell you that this happens somewhere else, I can extend the ruling, right? The illa resides there. So do we read in the text or do we read out from the text? Do we taking our imagination into the text or are we saying that the text tell us it's only wine, it's only vinegar, khalas, you're done, nothing else, right? So, so this is the, the, the idea of are our ethical, legal, technical concepts and imaginaries is dated? Is there some historicity to that? Or are they essentialist constructs? And for those in Islamic studies, these, these terms might resonate. And we talk about this in many areas of Islamic law. Then another question would be about ontology. What is the role of human reason in ethical reflection? Right? So those who love creedal studies, and we talk about Ashari and Mutazili, you know, and Maturidi uh, thought here. Right? What is, uh, are we bound as ethicists, I'm talking about Islamic ethics, to the tyranny of the text, what the text says? Or is there an independent ontological authority given to my mind, to rationality? Can we get at moral norms, right, just by using our, 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 our minds? Lying is good, right, well that's a bad example, let's use an example. Lying is bad, sorry, but li is lying good? How do we know that? Is that because Rasulullah said it? That the Qur'an tells us that? Or is that because I just have some fitrah, using that term, that is bad or good? Right, these are debates that are medieval debates, quote unquote, right? But ones that have a clear implication for how we define ethics and how we subscribe, circumscribe law in Islam. And this is actually at the center, a heart of Islamic bioethics. Finally, right, how do we integrate scientific knowledge and data into moral law? So, so, so this question, let me give you an example. So Islamic logicians, right, thought about, and I'll use Ghazali's um, rubric here, but they thought about how can we reach yaqeen? How can we know something yaqeen, right? There are di different levels and degrees of certainty. And uh, borrowing from some Hellenistic thought and other sort of, you know, philosophical thought, we, they, he determined and he said, okay, these are the ways that you can reach certainty. And this is actually part of all our deen, right? So for example, we think about the Qur'an as one that's inimitable and it is 100% yaqeeni for us. Right? Allah SWT says in the Qur'an, He protects it. But aside from that, because of the mutawatirat that it comes through, through the many chains of transmission through which each ayah of the Qur'an comes to us, that we have this logical idea that it could not be, these verses could not have been put together, there was no collusion to come up with the Qur'an. Right? And this is the basis for how we think about law and how we adjudicate degrees of certainty. But there's another realm, or there are many other realms, right? 
their mahsusat or the mujabbarat, right? So, they, so when I see something happen all the time, right, that I take an apple and it drops to the ground, can I be certain that there is an operative idea here that this is certain knowledge? That if I let the apple go, it's going to hit the ground. That's not in the text. How would I understand that? Can I reach any knowledge about that? What degree of certainty does it have? So this approach, the why I use that example, is that you can say, hey, look, we have clinical trials that tell us that taking, uh, you know, hypertension medicine will help prevent a heart attack, you know, to 50% probability over 10 years, whatever. That probabilistic thinking can be incorporated within Islamic law, right? If you understand how you reach certainty. And then if you reach certainty, I think in the of the shock, right? Then, then uncertainty is not something that we have to worry about. But that engagement with scientific knowledge is what is what's actually at the center as well of Islamic bioethics. Because if you say that, you know, that Dallah al-Fasid, Awla al-Muqaddim, Jamb al-Masalih, and you say, hey, look, X, Y, Z act is going to bring about mafasid, how certain are we about mafasid to use that qa'idah? Right? How certain are we about brain death when we say it's death? So these things are all part of Islamic bioethics as well, or are at least at the center of it. So I'm ending now. So there's a, this last question, and I'm just going to give you my vision here, but there's another question, as I said, about bioethics. So we spoke a lot about the Islam and why Islamic bioethics is important to Islamic studies, but let's talk about bioethics for a second. For a second. You know, bioethics is a field that is growing. That's my 40 minutes, I think. But bioethics is a field that's growing, and there's a question whether it's interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. By interdisciplinary, I mean that it resides, bioethics resides in the space between two different fields, or multiple different fields. And therefore, you need someone with expertise in multiple different fields to come at something that's bioethical. Or is it multidisciplinary? That all these fields inform a huge conception of what Islamic bioethics is. I am one who describes to the form, or to the, the latter. It's multidisciplinary. And so for me, when I think about Islamic bioethics, I think that there are some moral inputs from the Islamic tradition that are in discursive or they're in dialogical relationship to disciplinary partners from other areas. And that together then you come up with Islamic bioethics norms and values. Right? That just does, doesn't reside within one area or the other. But this is actually an open question as well. And will inform the way that we think about interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary studies from an Islamic perspective. Right? Whether it be finance or whether it be bioethics. So, so I'm going to give you two liners about my projects here and then we're going to stop and open for questions. Right? So, so I'm here, alhamdulillah, doing some research. You know, I, I, I was an engineer formerly, so I like running on the board. And so I'm looking at Maqas and Sharia, which you all know, uh, at least in the, in the conception by Imam al Shatlawi, right, that re revolve around these five Dururiyat, right, Dururiyat al Khamis, production of religion, life, intellect, lineage, and property. So my, my project really is just testing the Maqas, right? And I want to see it tested in different ways. And one of the ways I want to test it is subjected to this question you know, what are the essential dimensions of human health? Right? Can we back out? a theological construction of health by examining the dimensions of health that are embedded within definitions of the five dururiyat, particularly in Hizr al-Nafs or Hizr al-Hayat, depending on who you read. Right? What are the dimensions of health that are attended to by these dururiyat? And does that leave us with a conception of what the human being should be, what his wellness is? And the other question I'm subjecting it to is, right, can the, the maqasid uh, provide the hierarchical structure for uh, an ethical rubric for bioethics, as you're saying, right? So if you want to prioritize healthcare delivery, should we be focusing on you know, providing people houses or should we be focusing on giving people access to medicines for the flu? Right? That's a, a schema, that uh, the healthcare allocation schema that might be informed or may not be informed by the cost of the approaches. Can it provide an ethical legal framework for moral decision making? You have a patient at the bedside, right, who is near death. How do you prioritize interventions at that time? So this is the test that I'm subjecting the Maqasid frameworks for. Uh, this is, I'm going to not talk about this slide, but here are some of the, the, the preliminary papers that I'm, inshallah, hoping to author presently uh, before I leave. So with that, I will end. Oh, that went the field. Thank you very much.